everybody. Thanks for coming. We're very glad that you came. Um, just a couple of Just a couple of housekeeping uh, items to take care of. Um, you know where the lobby is. It's... Well, you know. Um, in case of uh, emergency, please note the exits at the four corners of the circle. Okay? Um, let's see, a couple of things about witches. Uh, one, don't feed them. They're on a particularly strict diet, um, and you probably don't have anything they want anyway, except just maybe some thumbs and some toes. Uh, just kidding. Uh, two, you may want to uh, avoid any sudden movements or thoughts because they're very sensitive. Okay. Three, uh, if you happen to be wearing something very um, aromatic or herbal in nature, it might, uh, you might get their attention. Okay. But don't worry too much about that right now. Uh, I'm a collector. I, I, I'm collecting witches uh, for the good of mankind. Uh, they might go extinct. So. Uh, anyway, uh, I think that's it for the moment. Uh, so thanks again for coming. Uh, relax, uh, but maybe not too much. And ooh, be careful because you actually might see a witch. I'm Liz Lerman. I'm so, so happy to be here with these amazing people, with all of you, and with the wonderful students from the colleges to help make us uh, be all together tonight. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the witches, but to begin, I'll just say that one of the rit sort of rituals we've begun in our rehearsals when we get to be together is uh, we decide, um, well, we're all gonna be a witch major, everybody's gonna be one witch, but we're also a lot of witch minors, so every day we decide what witch we'd like to be, and I thought maybe as you get to meet these three people, you, they'll tell you a few of the witches they've been. Paloma McGregor, um, the witch of ephemera, and the witch of witch. Hi, uh, Keith Thompson, the witch of in between, the witch of uh, absence, the witch of color, no color. 
uh, Sam Horning, um, the witch of conspiracy, uh, the witch of ambiguity, and the witch of indecisiveness. Actually, we've been talking about maybe the witch of the open book for, for Sam and actually that little trio that you might have seen down here had something to do with that. That's something we've been working on. Uh, one of my favorites is I've been uh, the witch of old libraries, uh, which I think I picked up being here because of the wonderful time I got to spend in your Denison Library. In case you haven't visited there, there is an entire bookshelf of witch books. And they're very old. In fact, there's one from the 17th century or thereabouts that really got me going. A man who uh, had uh, written his memoir, he was a trial judge from that period and killed 900 witches. And when you read the book, he's just so proud and so sure. And it's amazing just to you know, sit sort of in the, in the distance and look at this and, and recognize, of course, that um, this, this goes on all around us frequently, all the time, perhaps. Anyway, I want to tell you how I got into the witch thing. I, um, I mean, I have been interested in feminist issues my whole life. And uh, now that I'm older, although I've been working with older dancers my whole life, I am one now. And that's an interesting thing. And uh, just the idea of the kinds of wisdom that people hold. But I was in, on tour in uh, Scotland and went to their museum in Edinburgh, and there was an exhibit up called Wicked Bodies. And it was, in fact, uh, 500 years of drawings of witches. And that's the cover. And I, you know, I'd love for you to be able to see the detail. A lot of these drawings are uh, filled with just an amazing symbolism and uh, each little story in the corner. Uh, I joked with myself, now see, she's riding backwards on that animal. That's a big deal. They often were apparently backwards on the goats. It meant something. Um, I, I joked that if all we did was bring these pictures to life, it would be the most pornographic or scatological piece I've ever made. <laughs> this one I want to use for my calling card, sort of for mentoring, <laughs> mentoring purposes. <laughs> would, you, would you like me to mentor you? Yeah. <laughs> um, but they do bring a certain, uh, that day, I, I mean, I'm delighted by them now. Look at that one. Oh. But at the time, I was just, I, I, I went into shock. And I guess I asked myself, this question, uh, I asked myself, why was the imagery so persistent? And although this particular, oh, that's Cindy Sherman, you guys. You know how she puts herself in all of her own work? There she is, yeah. Um, this, this particular exhibit was uh, mostly of Western art, uh, Eastern European, Northern, and Russian. It was from that period. But I began to think that every, every culture has its witches. And every historical period has its witches. And why, why was the imagery so persistent? What was it about? And the second, uh, the second question is, um, and I say this now, it's not like you're going to see this in the work tonight. These kinds of questions, I feel, are like the driving questions that might hold an artist you know, sort of to their core for a couple of years, because it takes us two to three years to make something along these lines. And that is, why is some knowledge celebrated? some knowledge erased, and some knowledge criminalized. What happens? And how fast does that happen? We saw it, regardless of your politics, if you watched the Kavanaugh hearings, you saw how people were treating Dr. Ford at noon, and how she was being talked about by that night. What is it about the nature of people's knowledge, and what do we do with it, and how does that work? I got really interested in that. And the witches, it turns out, well, they give us some opportunity to think about that. So um, this part, what I wanted to do is just bring you into a little bit of the process that we've been doing. And we're going to start with some of the process that we did here with some of the students. Um, so Paloma. Hey, good evening. Um, so the first day we met, um, which was just a couple days ago, actually, um, our first question in our opening circle uh, was about who, what woman or women 
the students were bringing in with them, what women made it possible for them to be with us in the circle. We've been talking a lot in process about ancestors, and um, it's a particular interest of mine, and I'm, as we started talking, we started to develop a gestural vocabulary that kind of captured some of the essence of the stories that were being told. And so what you're about to see is the first phrase that we created out of that gestural vocabulary, and then we'll see the ways in which the students develop those into duets. to see the different ways each duet decided to develop the material. It takes a certain kind of generosity uh, and a certain kind of trust to work this way because you bring these stories, say, to a group of people and uh, you share them and then it turns into a movement and then the movement gets taken by somebody else and then that movement gets applied to, say, another story and suddenly the thing that was your grandmother's necklace becomes something entirely different. Uh, maybe part of uh, a goat's uh, saddle, and then what? For, for me, making work is entirely dependent on the people with whom I'm working. Um, it's interesting, I've been finding out about citizen scientists, science, and I have some friends in that world, and when they submit their grant applications, they list every single person who, say, contributed to sending them plastic from the ocean or something. And I'm trying to figure out if, for example, all of your names will appear every time we uh, make, seek support or try to get this piece out into the world, because people change what happens as soon as you're in the room, including you guys tonight and how you respond to what we're doing. But with the people who were close with me over a few years, I can't find the story until we find the story together. I mean, I have the historical ideas, and you'll see one of those uh, later tonight. But what's actually happening, and what is this actually about, and why does this matter, depends a lot on what each person brings. So um, Keith and I have been working together for mm, almost over a decade. I'm, <laughs> I'm so, so, so fortunate. He has an amazing dance background. You don't have their bios in the program, but uh, he was a member of Trisha Brown's company for a long time. He has his own work. He, he just an extraordinary career. And he's co-choreographer on this project and really, um, really helps make things better. <laughs> uh, Keith is uh, albino and, uh, or has albinism and, uh, this has been a subject of, of conversation between the two of us also for a decade. And at what point and how might we work on it and when and how does it enter? Because as I said, people bring themselves to the project and what part of themselves do they bring? So it turned out that by starting to look into the witches that maybe this would be an entry point. In some parts of the world, um, Keith would be revered because of who he is and how he looks and in some parts of the world, well, they would want his body parts now because they're so special. So I don't know if you want to say a little bit yourself and then we'll show them how we've started, how to, we've been starting to work on this. Yeah, yeah um, I, what Liz was saying was exactly right. We, I mean, we've been working together for a while, but this piece in particular um, is a huge opportunity to bring forward um, some of the 
some of my um, thoughts about um, albinism in, in itself and identity and uh, connection to who and how and why and what. So, um, and, the, and the one re uh, main reason is because I've, you know, as a child, um, I didn't know a whole lot, um, and as an adult, I'm able to sort of now muse about a lot of it. But as a child, you know, children would, uh, you know, children are so truthful, um, sometimes that it hurts. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, I would go, you know, home to my parents and, oh, what, you know, why do they say these things? Or why do I, it feels different with these people more than these people? And I just recall one thing that from my grandmother, what she told me um, kind of summed it up was that um, she said, uh, you know, difference, Keith, um, for, for everyone means something different, but difference for you actually means beauty. So. Um, so um, being in the, in the dance theater sort of realm, um, the question about how much do we say, how do we say it, how do we tell it to you, what kind of information do you need, is sort of a constant companion to the making of work. And I was really struggling with how this might work with, with, uh, with the witches. And so I'm going to give you a hint of some of the ways we're going to do a couple of things with some, some of Keith's thinking and my thinking, and then I'm going to tell you about the amazing Marta Gonzalez and how she fits into this. Um, Keith and I, I decided to work on this one day. We met in New York, and it was a, uh, a day we were uh, memorializing a friend of ours, a member of our company who had died over the summer, and I'd written about absence because, of course, she's gone now. And then I finally looked up albinism and found out that albinism, one way to describe it is that it is about the absence of light, that light doesn't enter. Keith's body the same way light, say for example, enters mine. And so I did some writing about this and we entered the thing first from the point of view of light. <clears throat> How do you make something about a thing that's not there? If the light waves can't go through you but instead push off your back out into the air, then you are white. If the light can't make it through you, but you move and exquisitely as if they did, you still have no color. If you have no color, you are mistaken for something you are not. And when you are mistaken for what you are not, then things happen for which you cannot be accountable. But you are. You are held up or pushed down for what you cannot make happen because the substance that makes it happen is absent in you. You are literally the form of absence. You are the living presence of absence. And that makes you magic. So that's one way we might do it. It's beautiful. In the 17th century, one of the ways you got your news is something called broadsides. They were ballads. And a lot of the ballads are actually about the witches and the witch trials that were going on at that time. 15th, 16th, 17th century, many, this went on for hundreds of years, a lot, a lot of trials and a lot of deaths. And these broadsides were full of that. So when I was uh, talking to Marta about being in the piece, first I had this thought that she could be the voice of the witches. Wouldn't that be spectacular? And of course you heard her and it is. But then Marta told me that uh, there's a form of singing the news in Mexico and she's going to tell you a, a little bit, oh, you can, uh, no, you need that one, yeah. A little bit about that form, and then she's written, again, just since yesterday, um, a corrido for, for Keith. Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, well, uh, a corrido, uh, a corrido is a, a 20th century art form that is actually still very uh, prevalent today, used, continues to be used in, um, uh, innovated on, and uh, it basically tells the news. And the format, one of the key uh, signature figures of, uh, of Corrido is that there is never a chorus. So it basically just establishes uh, who's involved in the story, uh, who is, um, what the story will be about, 
And then at the end of the corrido, which is, could be many, many stanzas later, uh, up to even 50, uh, you, you basically uh, know the moral of the story. And so um, in a war-torn country like Mexico, especially in all the revolutions that have taken place, uh, music became an important way in which uh, people were able to communicate the story from one day to the next, especially when the printing presses were broken or people were illiterate or so on and so forth. So music became very important. So in talking about uh, uh, what Liz just explained and um, Keith so beautifully demonstrated for us, I wrote him in a little verse in corrido style. Mil novecientos setenta en Mississippi nació un negro de los más blancos al vino por condición divino entre los cielos condenado a esta nación. Spell of the albino, witchcraft, a gruesome trade. Witch doctors are murdering albinos and harvesting their brains, teeth, and genitals for medicine Malawi, the sun. Can a new ban on witchcraft protect the albinos of Tanzania? NPR. Witch hunts increase in Tanzania as albino deaths jump, USA Today. The ritual murders of people with albinism in Malawi, amnesty. Thank you. So, um, and another part of the process, probably about a year ago, um, we were doing some discussion around like what is the shared language or the shared information that the witches have in this piece. Um, and on that day in particular, Liz came in um, with this idea of rage. And so we all generated from our own rages. I mean, knowing that our rage is probably different for each person who was in the room. So we made material, movement material from this idea of rage. And then we took that, I, those, um, that, that bit of material and we actually put it to an alphabet, like an A through Z alphabet as a way, um, as a way to remember and to use that material. Um, and one of the things that's so interesting to me about that is that we can actually use those letters to spell, to spell something. <laughs> um, and I think that's kind of magic. Um, so Keith and I are just going to show first just um, letters A through D. So that was A through D. <laughs> and we have all the way through Z. Um, and so then um, in, a few, in, a, in a later rehearsal, um, myself and Liz and another performer in the company, um, we were talking actually about the idea of whiteness. And we were trying to contend with what actually is it about whiteness if we were to try to break it down into something that can live um, in movement material in the body, what is that? So one of the things that came up was like, when we think about there's an unstable kind of bottom maybe, like there's a um, kind of falling out from underneath or there's an inability to kind of face it right forward. Um, there might be kind of a twisting away from the thing. Um, so then uh, myself and this other performer generated some other material which we now call the whiteness alphabet. And I should say, 
I'm gonna do the whiteness alphabet, and Keith is going to do the regular, the regular alphabet, just so you can see the difference between the two different alphabets, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on now and so another section of what we've been working on. Um, I had decided as I've, I've done the studying that we would do um, at least one trial. And it turns out that a lot of the witch trials, the European witch trials, they're a lot like the Nazis. They kept out, they, they're really well documented. I mean, they have the names of all, of mostly women, about 80% women. Uh, they have um, the actual description, they, a lot of the language in the thing. So we were trying to figure out which one. And then I, um, I came across um, some history around uh, James VI of Scotland, who's also James I of England, who's also the King James Bible. And uh, it turns out he has a significant role to play in the story of the witches. And as I read more about him, I thought to myself, how can one person create such havoc in the world? Uh, and then I remembered, of course, how one person could do that. Um, so I, I decided actually to pursue it a little bit with that as kind of an, that's not, really about our contemporary situation, but it was curious to, to look at that. So anyway, we're gonna do a little bit of a story about that. And does everybody have all the microphones they need? Yeah. Check. Once upon a time, there was a boy named James. He was a lovely boy, gentle, and sweet, and he liked other boys very much. A boy named James, a boy named James, when he was a king he made the blood of witches rain. A boy named James, a boy named James, he caused much havoc and inflicted much pain. On his first birthday, his mother's head rolled. He then became king as the bells did toll. Scotland had given him much to be proud, placing the crown on his brow, placing the crown on his brow. Little James, he grew from boy to man to king, visited Denmark and other lands and things, learned about witches and havocs they may wreak, and on his, his, on his way back his ship nearly did sink. A boy named James, a boy named James, when he was a king he made the blood of witches rain. A boy named James, a boy named James, he caused much havoc and inflicted much pain. He blamed the stormy winds on the twelve witches' head. Denmark seized them quick and made them all dead. A weather spell, he said, he escaped with his life. Now all of these witches must die. Now all of the witches must die. James thought it interesting. He even wrote a book. He named it Demonology, and the lands quickly shook. Went hunting for the witches and all their friends and foes. And the rest of the story here goes. And the rest of the story here goes. 
when he got back to his own country, he started hunting for other women who cast evil magic spells. He also hunted for women who might put magic spells on him in the future. Sure enough, he found many. He was so angry, he ruled over their trials personally and listened to their confessions. One of the women was named Agnes Samson. She confessed after King James commanded that she be fastened to the wall of her cell by a witch's riddle. An iron instrument with four sharp prongs forced into the mouth so that two prongs pressed against the tongue and the others against the cheeks. Only after this did Agnes Sampson confess to the 53 indictments against her. She was finally strangled and burned. All in all, during King James' reign, hundreds and hundreds of women died. A boy named James, a boy named James. When he was a king, he made the blood of witches rain. A boy named James, a boy named James. He caused much havoc and inflicted much pain. What the witches loved more than singing about James is putting him on trial. <coughs> After me. My mind is weak, I am not clever. 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 I am the murderer here, say it. I am the murderer here. I am the murderer. I am the murderer. I beg for forgiveness for all my crimes against the murderer. I beg for forgiveness for all my crimes. I'm 
envision myself devoid of all emotion and motion. I am not even a vessel, so unmoved am I. I rest on the hill above and watch unmoved and unmarked. My flesh lies far below in the distance. I witness the metal rod puncture the tongue. I feel nothing. I witness the metal rod stretch the face and penetrate. I feel nothing. The wind blows softly around me. I see the blow to the skull and observe blood seep through the dress. That is mine, but no longer mine. I am unmoved. A bird calls. The world revolves. An eagle flies. in progress events are so interesting <laughs> because um, you know it's really you know how when you're in the middle of something and your house is a mess but you know where everything is even though it's a mess okay and then people come over <laughs> you have to clean it up enough and then <laughs> then you can't find anything uh, but this but sometimes you clean it up and something happens and uh, I think, again, your, your wonderful attention this evening, you've been so attentive, um, really helped us just now. That really went somewhere. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe we'll just get ready to go into the last little section. Uh, perhaps I'd say, if you're able to see the piece when we finally finish it, that I imagine we didn't really get into it. You heard uh, Keith say he's the collector. There's a whole part of this piece where someone is collecting witches and uh, trying to categorize their knowledge, our knowledge, trying to figure out where they come from. Um, there's, again, this, uh, the ongoing story of the witches, and then there's the trials. And there's a, big, uh, there's a big conflagration during it, but you'll have to come see it to see all of that. Uh, the, we had hoped, and with the help of our students here, we tried. We wanted to try to get into some of 
uh, some of the sort of other powerful parts. And uh, let's see what you think of this last thing that we've made. And again, I thank you very, very, very much. And uh, Karina will come out afterwards. Thanks. Megan Hockaday. Natasha McKenna. Miriam Carey. Kayla Moore. Melissa Williams. Diana Stanley Jones, Agnes Sampson,